so welcome everyone. I'm Michael Lower, and I'm going to be the moderator for this uh, parallel session. And um, <clears throat> so uh, we've got uh, we have got three talks this evening. We've got overall each speaker has got twenty five minutes. Um, so hopefully divided between presentation of 15 to 20 minutes, then some time for Q&A. If you've got any questions for the speaker, please send them to me, Michael Lower, in the chat, and then I'll put those questions to the speaker at the end. Let me introduce to you Dr. Sarah Wilson from the University of York in the United Kingdom. And Dr. Wilson's going to speak to us about teaching law and history through a global pandemic, reflections on 2020, 2022, pandemic teaching, as reflections on teaching law in times of crisis. Okay, and um, thank you very much um, to the organisers for accepting my paper, and of course for giving the Directions community another opportunity to come together, albeit virtually and with, with some glitches. Um, now, I've spoken on teaching history in the 21st Century Law School several times over many years. Now, this um, happily includes at um, a previous Directions and at other dedicated legal education events. I've also spoken at general conferences across disciplines of law and history and across the world. Now, running through all these occasions and across all these different spaces have always been twin focal points. Now, these have been the um, exploring the value of historical approaches for enriched understandings of law and for promoting a vocational values within legal education. Now, in the past three years, the global pandemic and particularly the impact of COVID responses on university learning practices and experiences have brought different perspectives still. Um, and this means that um, I've, I've had a chance to sort of reflect on these, these, these twin focal points, um, I, but I've had to do so by sort of thinking about, well, what changes did I need to make by taking the module online? And then now more recently, um, what difference might it make to sort of bring the online class back into the classroom? So this has been quite a, an, an interesting time to sort of reflect on, on the module. Um, but today I'm going to sort of focus on, on these twin drivers in terms of the value I see attaching to teaching history for understanding law and how I see its value beyond learning law and speaking to how I feel legal education fits a broader vision for higher education within society. I'll be talking mainly to the latter um, today and connecting this with um, pandemic experiences quite explicitly, but in getting to the value I see for the module beyond learning law, I feel I want to say something about the value I see it having for learning law. And handily, this also allows me to introduce the significance that the module attaches to the core idea of lives lived in the 21st century and the actual content and structure of the module. So in terms of understanding what the, the module is, the module I teach to finalists here at York Law School was in many ways inspired by what I felt was missing from my own legal education um, some years ago. Today, it provides a space for exploring law's very nature and its function within society. It's in the context of English law that I teach it, obviously, though there are um, applications for this um, beyond this in, in other common law jurisdictions and also in um, civilian law traditions as well. And the emphasis of the module um, is really to sort of think about um, law um, and, and where it is and where it comes from by engaging with its origins and championing curiosity for ideas of continuity and change across time, both for law and also for society. And in this way, um, clearly the module um, has always been very much about the nature of law's relationship with society. It considers this elemental for asking whether the law that we have today is fit for purpose in the society in which we live, let alone the best which is capable of being achieved in order to support societal functionality and to nurture social cohesion and overall prosperity individually and in a collective sense. And in this vein, the approach adopted by the Law and History module presents itself very much as a resource of critique for law, 
and one which can be located alongside voices which have traditionally suggested that law is too male, too heteronormative, too white. But doing so in ways which have been done surprisingly um, little um, in legal analysis by thinking about law today in um, a historical sense, but also across long time frames. Now, this is achieved um, through the module's grounding in the students' own learning experiences. So what better way to try to get students to connect with law in different ways than to ask them how they already do connect with it and how satisfying that is. Now, for undergraduate students, the qualifying law degree and its foundational subjects have traditionally provided this bedrock. This is students' familiar territory for developing the understanding and criticality necessary as we engage with views of the world gleaned from the discipline of history and especially history's presentation of its relevance for the present. So for this, the module is framed pedagogically by how the disciplines of law and history ref respectively both reflect on the importance of the past. And it is this engagement with the discipline of history, which has been at the heart of the module's long-standing self-identification as law and history rather than legal history. Now, I say long-standing um, because um, rather than fixed and permanent and um, because it does seem that work like that of Dubber and Tomlins right at the bottom of the slide suggests that traditional understandings of legal history um, which have been very much a product of doctrinal analytical dominance could well be increasingly challenged going forward and actually that legal historians have an appetite for, for doing so. But in responding to um, legal history's more traditional basis and, and emphases, um, a law and history approach as championed by the module has looked to speak to the analytical aphorism of legal scholarship of a search for critique from without. And to do so by engaging within, with the discipline of history in ways which neither traditional legal history nor even socio-legal studies have done a great deal in the overall canon of legal scholarship. In focusing on this possible new direction for um, traditional legal history particularly, um, I, I, I love to talk about this at length because traditional legal history scholarship is useful to highlight for students a remaining strong bastion of doctrinal scholarship. This is once what all legal scholarship looked like. And um, also to make the point that if change is possible and legal historians have the appetite for it, there is still very much um, ground remaining to be covered. There is much more change um, that is necessary in my view, because what is e existing at the moment is neither conscious enough nor extensively evident enough to manifest historian John Tosh's um, reading of the continuing and embedded significance of the past at any point in time, including the present, including the future. And in focusing primarily on the lawyer's century of law reform of the 19th century, and one which Chantal Stebbings says has very profound legacy for law today, um, the module foregrounds Tosh's ideas on the importance of the past for the present and possible futures. Um, looking at this in terms of we can actually envision different um, futures and do so with the agency for achieving them. I think this is just really exciting to get students to think about law in this way, to get them to think about legal stasis and legal change um, in this way. This is living, this is evolving, and actually law can evolve in ways that um, we as a society want it to. And in looking to achieve this, the module is structured as shown here. It, compri it comprises a mixture of learning experiences which are built around specific substantive content and for example criminal law and private law and also key themes which are associated with law and in its sort of overarching sort of um, administration such as the emergence of the modern state and the significance of individualism in the liberal tradition of English law 
and the wider social significance of individualism. This format is designed to cater both for those who have studied history previously, um, classically um, at advanced level, and those who haven't. And for everyone, it is also designed to promote high levels of individual preference and interest in steering um, overall content um, towards particular interests. So this is particularly notable in um, the assessment that students have where they have a very high level of agency, but it is actively encouraged throughout, especially in the main class discussions crafted around subject specificity and overarching themes as aforementioned. And this can be seen reflected in a typical summative title, um, which asks students to think about how they learn law um, and how, um, how useful they think it might be to add um, historical approaches to the toolkit that lawyers already have. Do they think it's useful at all? Um, if so, why? If they don't, if not, why not? And then, you know, how, how might we operationalize that um, to continue sort of legal scholarships, traditions of, of, of rigor um, and, 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 and tradition? Putting all of this together, um, the module looks to um, construct a vista of what it terms lives lived in 21st century Britain, thinking about who we are and what characterizes us as a society. From this, we can think about the law that we have in positive and in less positive ways to try to understand the law that we have and also to think about law in an aspirational way. So when the module closes by reflecting on these questions here, um, they have actually been ever present throughout. And if we think back to John Tosh's core message that our presence and possible futures are actively unfolding and are not set in stone, the module is looking to convey a positivity and hope and a real sense of agency rather than inevitability. Having said all this, reflecting on the lives that we live at present as a touchstone for the lives we might like to have, um, this is actually pretty difficult at the moment. Um, in a world ravaged by COVID and now war in Ukraine, um, it's particularly hard, perhaps. But even prior to 2020, finding a sense of hope for the future for young people was already proving to be challenging as the 21st century shaped up, with its early years, of course, dominated by the global financial crisis and its aftermath for many of us. And although this does make for uncomfortable reflection and did do prior to COVID, student responses to the module have always been incredibly positive and, and very sort of resilient um, in lots of ways. Students really do see this as an unusual module, but one that actually really opens their eyes to law and how to think about it in ways that have been rarely, if at all, found in their studies. And that's wonderful. I really, really like that. Um, but what I'd like to focus on today is the very strong appeal that the module has um, in terms of the light that it looks to shine on society, social cohesion and citizenship which is a product of the way it asks us to reflect on our lives lived. So the module has always sought to reach beyond law, and here it has very consciously um, sought an avocational agenda. And the reason this is so significant, of course, is that this is a sort of a, a, a counterpoint to the highly marketized and vocationally oriented setting for legal education. Now, these values championed um, within um, and actually on account of um, what is the seemingly unstoppable neoliberal cascade. Now, the neoliberal cascade was conceptualized by Raywin Connell um, to sort of think about a sort of a public goods and public sector drift um, towards marketization across society. So this is not just education, let alone higher education. But higher education is, is what we do, um, and even non-academics, um, non-UK academics, will be familiar with this particular depiction of the UK higher education market agenda experience, because as Connell laments, the Australian experience which she writes on is evidence in many places, if not, not quite everywhere. 
And from this, most academics will be able to identify um, the general key tropes of the neoliberal cascade and their application to the legal education market more specifically. And this is where I want to present the idea of a post-pandemic emphasis for the module, which is new or at least slightly different. It has always um, championed a vocational values through this idea of lives lived. And what I'd add to that now is that sort of as we sort of try to come to terms with COVID's ravages as a crisis of an enormous, if not unprecedented stature, the current discourse and emphasis on COVID recovery is encouraging me to foreground the module's avocational emphasis even more strongly. This is a crisis which provides the opportunity to reflect on the kind of society we are and want to be, and might even force us to do so. Now, I do think it's important to stress that I am very proud that law and history is considered to have much added value for students who are thinking about themselves as young lawyers and are thinking about their career prospects. Students are often surprised by this, but, you know, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, but I'm also very happy to be directing the module in ways which question the strong marketised directions evident in legal education. I really do feel that at this point in human history, um, that higher education should reflect on its role in wider society and indeed its heavy responsibilities to provide support for living through difficult times for the community, for society at large, and also the space for generating the ideas and creativity which COVID recovery and beyond will almost certainly demand. And just to finish up, um, above all, um, I really do see this crisis moment as one in which I can steer the module more than ever towards emphasising the importance of finding a fuller sense of perceiving difficulties um, which, um, which are likely to dominate our lives and perceiving them with heightened sensitivity, perceiving them with an insight that we wouldn't have if we didn't engage with the past. And from this, generally to find a genuine sense of hope which can come from understanding human resilience and capability which I do think um, thinking about social change a social journey across time really does convey in a very useful way thank you very much thank you very much Sarah that was wonderful thank you um, so let me just remind people uh, any questions, please, in the chat. While we're waiting for those, if I'll just exercise my prerogative to ask some questions. Um, one question that um, struck me, well, that I wanted to ask is this. You kind, I think you kind of touched on this. But it seems to me that this law and history module, by giving students a sense, A, that law evolves, it, almost perhaps glacially, and all, but also that what informs its involvement, you know, the values that inform its evolution, you know, you know a, a kind of derivative from broader societal shifts. Mm -hmm. So what it seems to me, I don't know if you agree with this, is that mm -hmm. this is a very good module for any, at least any common lawyer to study, because if they don't have this dimension, they will really understand the, the, the text they engage with, the cases they engage with. Yes, I would absolutely agree with that. And, and, I, and I'll sort of, sort of make two points that, that shoot off from that. Um, first of all, this is something that students really do perceive. They think, wow, you know, I really don't think I ever truly understood law before. Yeah. I've learned it. And I've kind of understood it, but now I can see why the law of negligence didn't appear until the early 20th century and how it stood absolutely no chance of taking off during the 19th century. Um, and and it, it is remarkable just how little time it takes students to grasp that. And actually every year in student feedback, I get, could we please do more of this and could we please do it earlier? in the curriculum. So one, one of my other sort of um, um, focuses for conferences is um, embedding law and history in the law curriculum. 
yeah, and the advantages of, of doing that. So that's 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 one of my long term projects. And I, I suppose what I'd add to that is this is something that that legal history, even in its most doctrinal and traditional sense, has always said, you know, um, and, and David Ibbotson makes this point really well, you know, and that, that the nature of the common law is, is 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 so so sort of fixed on on precedent. It's so so inextricably linked with with its past that you can't actually understand law um, without this, and therefore you cannot be um, a confident law reformer. So so but I suppose what I want to do in law and history is say that's a good starting point, but what legal history in its traditional sense has not followed up on is where that change comes from, what drives it, you know, where, where, you know, why, why do judges decide that something does need to change or doesn't, and, and you know, where is that coming from, um, and then of course, you think about um, well, whose interest is that reflecting, um, and 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 who's not being included in this? So, um, I, I I really do believe that that's right, and and I really think this is an argument that traditional legal history has always made. But I think traditional history has been very slow in following up on the full implications of that. Yes, thank you. Yeah, fascinating. Um, Sarah, Steve has got a question. We have to be really quick with it because. Yeah, we, sure. Uh, 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 yes. By the way, thank you very much for st flip, uh, stepping into. Oh, no problem at all. No problem. So Steve says, thanks for a great presentation, Sarah. Although the students appreciate this course, do other colleagues question its place on a law degree? Yes, um, yes they do, um, um, but not necessarily for the reasons you might think. Um, we're all sort of quite preparatorial about um, teaching and particularly options. Um, and we know that options can actually live and die by, by sort of student preferences. And I, th I think what I've encountered most of all um, is, is fear from colleagues. You know, okay, this sounds interesting, but how do I do it? I'm not a historian. No. Um, and, and so I think it's breaking down this idea that um, you have to be a trained historian to think like one. Um, and for that, my obvious riposte is, as, as John Tosh says, we're all historians. You know, we, we, we are all a sort of a product of, of our experiences. And, you know, we are all on our individual as well as part of a, a greater collective journey. So um, I haven't I haven't encountered as much resistance from colleagues as I might have done. Um, and where I have, um, I think that it really is very much a case of fear of the unknown and not one, not doing it properly. I mean, the argument is if you have to spend sort of seven, eight years becoming a legal academic, why do you think you can suddenly become a historian? Thank you very much, Sarah. So, Thank you. Super. Um, uh, now, uh, to, over to Dr. Anna Tsanaki. Anna, I don't know whether you managed to whether it's resolved I, the problem. I think I did, and thank you for your patience. Thank you. That's great. We can see the slides. Okay, that's brilliant. Uh, one... While you're doing that, while you're okay, let me just reintroduce you. Dr. Anna Zanaki, Lund University, and you're going to speak about the interbeing of law and economics, building bridges, not walls, inter interdisciplinary scholarship and dialectic pedagogy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think actually it's great that I got to talk after Sarah. Um, I also talk a lot about interdisciplinarity in my talk and some of the ideas that Sarah mentioned I will also be developing here. Um, so let me give you a little bit of background of how I came to, what was the motivation for this paper. Basically, I'm, um, I'm a competition lawyer and I teach uh, business law in general. So, and that is how I came into law and economics. Uh, somehow, and I'm a very um, great advocate of law and economics uh, in uh, the legal courses that I teach. Um, also, that is influenced due to my education that I received in the US. 
Um, and sometimes people say, oh, but wait a minute. <laughs> Law and economics, like as I was saying, is neoliberal, is all this and all that. Um, but my point, uh, and I want to mention this before I start the presentation, is that, you know, I think that law and economics is a great positive tool and they can shed light to um, many boxes that we use as lawyers. And that is the appeal they have to me. And somehow I feel that they also add to the European experience and tradition we have. Now, for example, I'm based in Sweden. Um, principles of transparency are very important here. So I do think that you know different perspectives, interdisciplinary perspectives are adding to law and we have nothing to be afraid about it. So after this uh, short introduction, let me start with the presentation. So as I said, I mean, uh, I came to this paper, there was um, a similar pedagogical conference uh, a couple of years back here in Lund. So I tried to give a presentation about how we can bring these two disciplines of law and economics together and how they can speak to each other also perhaps not only from a scientific, but also from a pedagogical point of view. And what, that, uh, what does that mean? So this is how I came up with this idea of the interbeing, meaning also the interdependence a little bit of these two fields of study. So um, what, was, uh, what were the questions that triggered this paper and you know, um, uh, came uh, so that I came up with the structure that I did? I mean, you, uh, let me also say that you can find the paper on SSRN. Um, it's also published, but I, I, will all, I will highlight some the key ideas, let's say, that they're in the paper. The paper is a bit richer, so if you want, you can go and check that out. Um, so again, the idea of interbeing is that, you know, perhaps there is some connection indeed between these two disciplines, and are we missing something if we are only focusing on one of them? So I wanted to flesh that out to begin with. And secondly, I mean, um, as scientists, and especially in the modern times where, you know, there is an, an abundance of information and, you know, we tend to over specialize in our own fields of study, um, how can we perhaps um, like this search for interdisciplinarity can help us to go beyond disciplinary boundaries. And I think one way of doing that is bringing these two fields of study of law and economics together um, in, in theory, but also in pedagogical practice. So linked to that is then how do we see ourselves as scholars of law or economics and teachers? And can we learn something from other disciplines? Um, and can we also learn perhaps to improve our teaching uh, by adopting this um, interdisciplinary perspectives? Um, and not only that, but how do we translate those lessons to our students who, as Sarah said, are not to be seen only as students, but also as future citizens of modern societies. So I see a continu continuity here. Um, where knowledge is not only in, the, in this uh, narrow service of providing some commercialized, let's say, uh, ready-made education, but it has a broader purpose in society in building future citizens um, that are prepared uh, to uh, deal with um, complex problems and challenges of the 21st century. Okay. So um, in the beginning, I have this code from the Pink Floyds, another brick in the wall. Okay, so what is education? What are we trying really to, to do here? Is it that we're uh, only trying to um, you know, communicate some fixed kind of knowledge to our students who happen to be in class? And what is education in general in the 21st century, as I was saying? Like, is it simply some kind of commodity, something that we need to produce that is um, all the same uh, around the world? Or, you know, is it just even a narrower understanding of um, education? You know, we need to provide um, young people with some means to uh, make a living or careers, um, or is it, 
a more broader sense of education that we're looking to serve. Um, and I link that um, notion of education to the ideas of enlightenment and, and empowerment here, um, considering, as I said, that we are not supposed only to educate students in the narrow sense, but also future citizens. Um, so I, um, um, I question a little bit this idea, as I said, of education in the 21st century. And is it just future workers that we want to create uh, through um, uh, university education? Or are we really trying to go for something bigger, such as um, developing more resilient and more inclusive societies? So, and this, um, these questions brought me to the idea of interdisciplinarity. Why interdisciplinarity? Why could this be one answer to this um, uh, modern prototype of education uh, in the 21st century that we need to serve? Um, I argue that, you know, we need to go beyond disciplinary silos. I mean, um, as useful as it might be to specialize in our field, as I already said, you know, um, and there are many reasons for that. One is, you know, there is a lot of uncertainty and epistemic complexity. So we try to narrow and break problems down in order to be able to solve them. But I think there is still great value in seeing the big picture. And I do believe that there are emerging problems and challenges, for example, sustainability, uh, digitalization, and, and others that, you know, do ask for such interdisciplinary approaches. Um, so um, also going beyond the scientific, you know, perspective, um, our educational, uh, you know, uh, perspective sometimes uh, seems to be overly focused and law is uh, a good example, I think, of that. We tend to over-specialize, not only, you know, like we distinguish between public and private law, but then we go and um, specialize into narrower fields within those broader fields. And somehow I'm afraid that sometimes perhaps we lose the big picture, as I said in a way that does not, is not always helpful in solving these big societal challenges. So what interdisciplinarity can help do is I think as the title of my paper suggests is build bridges and you know, uh, make us more aware of the junctures that we as scientists and teachers encounter and perhaps make us enable us to decide in a more informed way, which way we need to turn in each of these juncture, junctures. Um, so interdisciplinarity is not only a scientific approach, but I'm arguing that it is also learn, a learning and teaching approach. And this is the attitude that we need to instill to students so that they're more curious perhaps to, uh, to search for more holistic answers uh, going beyond um, the narrow knowledge that they learn. Um, as lawyers. <clears throat> and how can interdisciplinarity can help in specific ways? Um, so from the scientific point of view, you know, there is this cross-pollination of knowledge from one field, in this case, from economics to law, but, you know, this can be applied to any disciplines, basically. And I'm also arguing that this serves the broader idea of dialectic pedagogy pedagogy. We're also teaching our students um, uh, in a practical way how, how to create dialogue between um, and debate between issues or, um, you know, um, disciplines that are different in focus. Okay. Um, then later in the paper, I tried to describe a little bit the starting points or the foundations of law and economics and what could be perceived as their differences. Um, and for example, in theoretical terms, you know, law is founded more on ethics, whereas economics is also founded on mathematics and statistics. Law is very much based on traditional authorities like uh, the law in books. We say sometimes that what is 
that that is you know law is codified in statutes but also the precedents so past court decisions are very important here to decide and to interpret the law on the other hand you know economics is based on um, more general principles economic principles such as the law of supply and demand um, the law is um, you know uh, looking at the facts of the specific case to uh, to be applied in that concrete case, economics looks for evidence in statistics, as I already said. So from that point of view, one could argue that the orientation of the law is more to the past. So as I said, we look at the codification of laws or, you know, precedents of past decisions, whereas economics uses all this um, statistical and other tools in order to make predictions. So in that sense, we can say that it looks more to the future. Um, then in terms of concepts, uh, law is uh, very much based on ideas of legitimacy. Can we do that? Is it the right thing to do that? Um, are we allowed to do that? Whereas economics has a more realistic perspective. Um, it's um, structure is based on the idea of an of scarcity, scarcity of resources in the real world. Um, whereas in terms of goals, law is has this basic idea of justice uh, as a goal, whereas economics is on the other um, side of the spectrum, trying to find solutions that are efficient, basically. So how can this uh, seemingly very different worlds speak to each other and make sense. Um, I'm making a very short historical, um, you know, journey to the past, and I'm trying to find example where I'm suggesting that, you know, legal solutions in the past um, perhaps are inf were influenced from um, economic uh, thinking. And I give the famous example of um, the Ulysses and the Sirens, where, you know, um, uh, Ulysses is asking his um, uh, um, partners in the ship uh, while going back home that they tie him to the mast so that he's not, not lured by the song of the Sirens um, while they're passing by. And he knew that although that song could be very appealing and if he wanted to listen to it, if he did, then he would change his mind and he would be lured. And then basically the sirens would have killed the whole crew, including himself. So the brilliant idea that Ulysses found is that, you know, um, uh, he asked his partners to uh, be wax their ears and that uh, they tie him to the mass, so without uh, anything in his ears, so he can hear the song, but since his hand would be tied, he couldn't take any action to divert the course of the ship, let's say. So in this way, um, uh, Ulysses found a way to constrain himself and to constrain himself against, um, you know, irrational action that would lead to his own destruction. Um, so this example also illustrates the idea that sometimes we're in conflict between different selves that um, we have, for example, our present and future self. And Ulysses was brilliant enough to understand that. On the other hand, uh, you know, solutions in the past, uh, for example, we can see institutions in ancient Athens where uh, economic thinking was um, included, for example, in tax policy to create um, and streamline um, good incentives for citizens to um, report um, honestly um, their property, for example. So there were these institutions of little years, which was some kind of public function that was um, imposed on the wealthiest citizens. So, for example, they had to uh, sponsor um, theater plays or the um, construction of a warship. And the interesting thing here is that, for example, if you had to sponsor um, a warship, you also had to lead that ship to war, meaning your incentives by being on that ship 
you know, your life will depend as much as anyone else's life on constructing that ship well. Um, and in this way, you know, the um, ancient office pol policymakers uh, found ways to streamline incentives, so to say. The same, um, same uh, similar ideas are behind this institution of antithesis where you had to declare um, the value of your property. And if you didn't agree to pay tax um, based on that value, and you could argue that someone else was wealthier um, than you, um, then um, the wealthiest citizens would have to pay um, uh, for the tax. And, uh, and if they didn't agree to pay, they would have to swap their property with you. Meaning, you know, if they didn't agree to pay, they would assume that their va the value of their property was larger than yours. So um, these are some examples of how we tried in ancient Greek uh, to um, align, let's say, social and private incentives, which is something that welfare economics sometimes um, try to uh, solve. Um, and then, you know, in ancient Greeks, Greece, we also had this um, broader notion or place which is called Agora. And Agora, it's not only a place where you could exchange goods, but it was also a public space for debate where citizens, free citizens could um, uh, freely uh, come together and discuss issues of public interest, actually. Uh, so where does this lead us? So based on this um, historical exploration that I do in the paper, I'm arguing that, you know, law and economics could be a very, bringing them together could be a very useful way of creating a class movement. And I mean this into, into uh, in a double sense, class movement in the sense of a movement in class. So um, during um, teaching hours, but also um, as a broader social movement, I would say. And what do I mean by that? I mean that this interbeing uh, or bringing together law and economics has some kind of scientific value or appeal in the sense that, you know, we show in practice to students that not all answers lie within the law or, you know, even within the tools of economics as useful and insightful as they may be. And also, um, this interbeing points to um, uh, social problems. And, you know, there are famous law and economic articles, such as the scholarship of uh, Ronald Coase, that points to this problem of social cost and externalities. And I think it's a great way to raise to the attention of law students that how much interconnected indeed we are. Um, then this inner being has ethical value as well. So it's not only of making, um, bringing to the attention of students these uh, scientific findings, but also uh, essentially building the character of both teachers and learners in class. And I also believe that, uh, you know, beyond the narrow scientific, you know, value, we can also learn to be more humble. Uh, both as lawyers as an economist, because as I said, um, no discipline basically has all the answers. Uh, finally, I think we can build some emotional report. Um, so that's another benefit of this interbeing in the sense that, you know, students uh, learn to connect over shared values and experiences. And sometimes those different values could be identified outside the law and also establish a more common ground and future vision from the, uh, for the future um, besides the past, basically besides any tradition and that could be disciplinary or you know, societal tradition. So zooming in a little bit into these three perspectives, the science perspective first, uh, essentially, I'm saying that, you know, law is not an autonomous system, it exists in context, it is a social phenomenon, just as Lara said, bringing the example of law and history. So here, bring the example of law and economics. 
And essentially, I'm arguing that, you know, law is a great tool to point to um, um, new policy solutions, but it would be an even greater tool if it's informed by economic insights. And the added value of economics is that, you know, sometimes as lawyers, as I said, we are a bit constrained in our traditional legal boxes. We call that formalism sometimes um, in legal parlance, so it can help us go and move a little bit beyond that. But also, I think the value of economics is that it's trying to make plain or unveil um, hidden value judgments or claims that we do that very often embedded into law, but they are not explicit. So I think that's another great benefit. So how can we see interdisciplinarity in action? I'm saying that um, the other benefit of this in their being is that, you know, we don't need actually to sacrifice academic precision, you know, as lawyers. Um, while incorporating uh, in science from economics. So we can keep a door open, whereas while not overflowing the law with economics. And at the same time, you know, provide for more realistic and holistic approaches to solving social problems. Uh, I'm arguing that interdisciplinarity, basically it's a way of thinking and solving problems. Um, so, and also it induces two-way communication between these two disciplines, but also more broadly. And in that sense, it's a great tool to um, encourage actually learning and um, align with the evolution of, you know, the reality within which we are living and the new conditions that we find ourselves. So what about the pedagogy perspective? I'm arguing that interdisciplinarity and the interbeing of like in economics in specific, it's a great example of a connected curriculum because it connects research to, to reality and others, others that exist in society or in class. And also it induces out of the box thinking. As I said, lawyers, sometimes we think into uh, in fixed boxes and that's not necessarily bad. It's very useful. Categories can be very useful, but um, perhaps sometimes we also forget why we started having those boxes to begin with. So at the same time, um, you know, we, int we introduce this idea of inquiry-based education that it's more solution-oriented, I would say. Um, another benefit is that, you know, interdisciplinarity is helping us to navigate change, and as I already hinted, so our role as teachers and uh, students, it's very much in flux, especially today that, as I said, there are so many challenges and including the digital challenge. And in that way, you know, um, in helping us navigate change, it knows it's also empowering us in providing resilience. Um, another, I think, great benefit of bringing law and economics together is also to see that there is not one single law and economics, but there are several types or varieties of it. So I'm arguing essentially of a non-authority centric educational model um, where we showcase the diversity of views within those fields. And in this way, we are um, inducing um, uh, not and endo dogmatic uh, perspective in our students, and we are also um, um, encouraging um, uh, an approach that is uh, encouraging our unity in our di diversity. Uh, what about the cultural perspective? Essentially, I'm saying that interdisciplinarity is also uh, encouraging certain values, as I already mentioned dialogue in class and in society, so democracy as well, and also a sense of curiosity, but also respect for diversity. And in that sense, not only we help individuals to develop in their own terms, but we also care for the common good. So it's a win-win situation. At the same time, we um, encourage a certain vision um, a certain vision of society as a knowledge society. We encourage collaboration and contribution of individuals. 
but also we encourage human and social transformation. So as I said, we don't need to be tied to fixed boxes. We can go beyond them and learn from our differences. And at the same time, we learn, I think, to expand our horizons and perspectives. So students learn not to fear error. They understand that error is a bit relative once they look beyond their narrow discipline. Um, they look more for authentic responses and authentic aspects of themselves. And so we also uh, encourage innovation in and outside of class and essentially co-creation. And in this way, you know, the interbeing of law and economics is pushing boundaries, is changing the narratives a little bit of those disciplines, and it's also building more, you know, um, resilient partnerships. Um, so bringing all this together, I'm arguing that, you know, we can perceive the classroom um, as a classroom marketplace, you know, taking this idea of free markets. Um, so it is a marketplace that it's free, where teachers and students are, so to say, price taker. And what does that mean? We're equals, essentially. Nobody has um, uh, market power over the other. And that is where these ideas of democracy and dialogue can really flourish. And it's also a, a place where um, you know, exchange is voluntary, so solutions work for the benefit of all. At the same time, it's a place where it's open, people can come and go, they can express freely their preferences. It's not a top-down model of control, but it encourages self-ownership and essentially inspiration over coercion of, stu uh, of uh, students. Um, lastly, it's a place that it's lively, Oh, sorry, I don't know what happened. And essentially we encourage uh, dialogue and experimentation. So organic growth instead of, um, uh, you know, um, a fixed education mindset. And in that sense, we encourage also creative destruction in higher education. So perhaps more ideas and more change for the common good. And at the end of the paper, I have Thank you. So you can read that. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Anna. It was fascinating. I've got questions, but I'm afraid we don't have time for any questions. So thank okay. you very much for your paper. Um, and, but I'm afraid because of the timetable, I'm going to have to pass over now to our third paper. So uh, pro with Professor Ngobo Emese, Dr. Ilias Capsis, and Dr. Pedi Albani, from the University of Bradford in the UK, are going to speak about mainstreaming sustainability in legal education. Over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, hope you can hear me. Uh, good morning. Um, uh, this is actually a school level approach to designing um, our programs. And that's why we've got all three of us who've been key to both developing this approach uh, to embedding sustainability in a legal curriculum as well as delivering on those. So um, what is the backdrop to this? Um, I am an environmental, well, environmental lawyer, broadly speaking, law and policy. And for quite a while, I've walked around uh, program development, uh, looking at uh, how we could mainstream sustainable development in law. And invariably, the traditional approach in most law schools have been to introduce a sustainability module or to introduce an environmental law module. But it became very clear to me, especially when I became more involved with distance learning that sustainable development isn't something that is for environmental lawyers or people who are interested in sustainable development per se, but that really the complex challenges that we face in the world today all have to come from a place of understanding the three key pillars that sustainable development is about. And that if you have to be a good commercial lawyer, if you're a good human rights lawyer, regardless of the field that you're looking at, these three components are really important. 
Also, we find, for instance, that a lot of commercial lawyers and those will be involved in things like arbitration. They'll be making decisions around frameworks such as the WTO, where you have to apply these principles, but without a real grounding or understanding of it. And from my perspective, when I do research, I sometimes find that decisions are made by commercial lawyers without a real grounding or understanding of how the principles apply in the real world or how they may affect the decisions may affect the, these three uh, core areas that we're looking at. Uh, and of course, in addition to that, the UN has, and, and my colleague is going to be speaking to that in a bit. Um, it's way back in 1992, declared the decade for sustainable development. And this challenge that we need to provide holistic educational response to sustainable development as a global challenge. And therefore, we had the opportunity back in 2018 of developing new programs in our, on, in our, on, on our master's LLMs. And we decided then to really rethink how we design this program and how do we embed sustainability across our programs. We have four main programs and in all of them, we felt that sustainable development needed to be embedded. And the approach we adopted was to have one core module that runs across all programs, but ensure that we identify key strands that then run through each of the programs at modular levels uh, as we go forward. Uh, so today, my colleague Paddy will talk about the broad framework, the uh, policy framework within which uh, we, we've adopted this. Elias will talk about how we've implemented it. And I'll come back to do a bit of a reflection on this. Part of what we've done is sort of review the program ongoing. We've had a focus group with our students uh, in addition to evaluate uh, module evaluation uh, feedback, sort of get a sense of how we've achieved our goal of ensuring that there is a common understanding of how each field comes to this topic and how we can work together in a holistic manner to advance some of our goals in society. And on that note, I'll hand over to Pedi. Thank you very much, um, Ngobu, and hello, everyone. So within the broad context of the background for Education for Sustainable Development, we go back to trying to understand exactly what the concept is, and it's more about lifelong learning. So it isn't only about education at one level, but it's about catching them young, but remaining with the learners all through, even as they go outside of the formal education setting. And it's also geared towards eliciting both personal and societal transformations as well, as a way of actually reaching solutions to global development challenges, because those complexities, which Ngomo has talked about, do not um, lend themselves to any simple solutions. And in order to achieve that level of transformation, then the lifelong learning um, process or the lifelong learning approach is important within the context of education for sustainable development. What we also find is that it does require learning both at the cognitive level, the social emotional level, but also at the behavioral level as well, such that students not only understand the broad concepts, the interlinkages between the problems, the ways in which solutions impact on other solutions and structures broadly and institutions as well interact, but also that the, the emotions of the students are affected, their social, instruction, social interactions are affected and they're indeed um, inspired to take action practical action beyond knowledge of the, the principles, the skills, and the theories. Um, if we look at the SDGs themselves, we'll find that indeed the way in which the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals have been designed, does reflect the need for sustainable development, not only in um, the environmental field or the social field or the economic field, but indeed in an interdisciplinary manner that allows us to consider the impacts of the environment, for instance, on society, on the economy and vice versa. Um, and this is not only within the context of developing countries, as we had with the MDGs, for instance, the Millennium Development Goals, but broadly as an understanding that global challenges have implications for different regions in specific ways. Um, looking at the milestones for Education for Sustainable Development, or ESD, we've come from the angle that in 1992, like Ngobo mentioned, we had the declaration and all of that. But some people may want to take this as far back as 1972 and the Stockholm Declaration, because even within that context, we find that education was seen as being in, on this, um, important in understanding and addressing environmental matters. But because of the bias as well among 
certain people that sustainable development is essentially environmental, we've tried to, you know, focus more on um, illustrations of these interlinkages. So in 1992, for instance, if we look at the UNF, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, it does talk about this need for education, training, and public awareness as a way of tackling climate change. And we know that climate change does have implications beyond the environment. If we also look at the Convention on Biological Diversity, it again mentions the importance of education in addressing those challenges. Um, so there's 1992, in 2002, we have the declaration from the UN, and then we have had other declarations as well. And more recently in 2019, we had um, a declaration of or the adoption of ESD, um, Education for Sustainable Development for 2030, essentially in connection with the sustainable development goals. And that broadly provides the framework within which we are now going to present to you about um, the programs at the University of Bradford. Um, so broadly speaking, the Education for Sustainable Development 2030 framework brings key directions and principles that are relevant for education in law, but also in other disciplines as well. So one is about raising awareness of the SDGs in education settings, but it's also about ensuring that there's this critical and contextualized understanding of the SDGs, not as standalone goals or as goals that are only relevant within certain contexts, but as goals that have implications for the ways in which we study law, but also practice law even beyond the academic setting. Another key direction within the context of ESD is about mobilizing action towards achieving SDGs. And if you look at the principles, the transformative action, structural changes, and technical future, it already highlights the need to go even beyond the strict confines of education practitioners to also um, meeting together or collaborating with people in the industry, policy makers, international organizations, third sector, and the wider community as well, because indeed to achieve the level of transformation that is required, all hands need to be on deck. This diagram is from the UNESCO 2030 roadmap for ESD, and it shows the core dimensions of um, ESD linked to the 17 SDGs as well. Um, it, it doesn't look too broad on the screen, but we hope that you're able to look at this afterwards. And if you look in depth, what we find is there are three key dimensions that are exposed, the cognitive, the social, and the behavioral, like I mentioned earlier. Essentially, what this has meant for us is that we think about designing the curriculum for um, education for sustainable development, essentially as one, being important to ensure transformation, that the elements of transformation come through. And this is transformation for the learner, but also for the society. And we talk within, or we, we act within this context to ensure that our learning outcomes and broad approaches, which Ilias will touch on more um, in-depthly, inspire some level of disruption, ensure courage, persistence, and determination in the learners, but also inspire a personal conviction in learners, irrespective of their specific disciplines or interests. It also means that we want to go beyond the single module, like Ngobo has mentioned, to providing a mainstreaming approach in the curriculum across all levels. And this is something that is required to be able to achieve education for sustainable development. So broadly within the context of the University of Bradford School of Law, this is what we've done. And I think I'll hand over to Elias to tell us a bit more about it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Betty. Uh, so I'll speak a little bit more about the actual, let's say, uh, delivery of these uh, goals. Uh, we've obviously uh, thought uh, a lot about how we design a curriculum uh, based also on the experience we had, but also on the reflection, the national reflection as well. For example, it's not only about having an interdisciplinary approach, but it's also about how you build a true let's say, a reflection and a true transformation uh, of knowledge uh, and the society using that knowledge as part of the curriculum. So first, let's describe what we are doing in Bradford. So the, the module, we have a module which is scored across all, all masters. So all students have to take it. And you can see we have a diversity of subjects at the master's level, we have international commercial law, we have legal studies, we have human rights and development, we have natural resources, environmental law and policy. So all those students, regardless of their pathway or of the uh, direction, their special, intended specialization, they have to take the module as a core uh, 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 module. So uh, the other thing we're trying to achieve already, as I mentioned, this interdisciplinary element has been also uh, very well explained from my uh, the previous uh, speakers in the election way. 
So we try to, to incorporate in the curriculum in a what we call dynamic way, not static way, saying for instance, you cover different aspects. That's good as a very basic knowledge, but we want the students to interact with these different disciplines and different areas which are, are part of the, this very complex, to be fair, concept of sustainable development. So we're trying therefore to encourage students to incorporate all those elements and try to find what we call holistic solutions. Again, this term holistic solutions is sometimes easier to define, but harder to implement in practice. But we do want our students, what we're trying to achieve here, students with open mind, out of the box thinking, which can try to think in a way which is innovative, a way that can lead to different solutions if you want from the ordinary, different from, uh, let's say, uh, those maintaining the status quo in certain areas, because we do know that in order to achieve sustainable development goals, there must be transformation of policies, transformation of ideas. We can keep going the way we have been going for during the past two, three decades. So uh, the other, of course, priority is to ensure that in those areas covered by the module, we have the best people in terms of expertise and knowledge. And we do cover, as you will see, a diversity of areas. So some of the key principles of the curriculum design is first of all, to make it accessible to a diverse cohort of students. Uh, in Bradford, we've been very blessed to have uh, large cohorts which are international, generally international, about 70% of our students are international. And even those who are from within Bradford and UK are very diverse in terms of background. We are, as a, a university, we're awarding the Times Higher Education uh, Award for the uh, social inclusion. Uh, last year, so we do have a very uh, sort of appreciation and experience of dealing with diverse audiences. So one of the priorities is therefore to build curriculum within the module, which gives access to such diverse uh, uh, cohort. Contextualization of learning is important, has been highlighted by our previous speakers as well. And we try to do it in a way that maximizes benefit from the students encourages also students to research uh, and discuss the SD principles independently, but also working in uh, multidisciplinary sometimes groups. What we mean is they would bring also sometimes people with expertise outside, uh, and some students have because law has increasingly diverse background. We have economy studying for the, for example, on the LLM, we have social scientists, we have, uh, uh, let's say from other disciplines, so what we try to do is here is exactly to bring, we don't want, let's say, a group where it's, let's say, a collection of monologues, where each one brings their own ideas and they stop there. We want them to interact, we want to synthesize ideas and come back in a meaningful way out of those meetings of the group or in the classroom. We always try to make this connection between sustainable development theory and SDG frame was very closely associated. So in each session, we have clear links of the topic to the SDG or SDGs in question. And could as critical thinking and evaluation for this, we try to achieve it also by bringing it what we call few ideas for the future. Not so much, let's say, about reviewing the status quo, reviewing existing ideas, but what we can do five, 10 years later. Where can we be as a society? How we can incorporate technological developments, new developments in various fields and be there in five, ten, uh, ten years. And then contextualized assessments, we have already mentioned, so contextualization, so not only in the knowledge, but also in the assessments in terms of allowing students to present a topic of their interest, regardless of their area of interest or uh, their background. But of course, the idea is through comparative study, to comparative study, to compare and contrast different approaches and find the way the best synthesize ideas and come up with the best possible solutions for the program in question. And of course, constructive alignment is a key principle to ensure that the learning outcomes, class tags and assessments around uh, sustainable development principles and solutions are there for everyone. Uh, now, I mean, I have uh, made a uh, group quickly go through uh, some of our the ways that we implement those ideas, uh, taking into account as well the ACD framework uh, for uh, on the cognitive learning dimension, for example. We want students to understand sustainability challenges, the complex in the linguages, explore disruptive ideas and explore alternative solutions. So in this context, we try to use a mix of activities within the sessions. So we start with a general uh, three first weeks, three first sessions are more broadly introducing the subject, the key dimensions 
of sustainability and in a more generic way and key themes. And then the rest is moving into a sector by sector, if you want approach, sectoral approach, so case studies, collection, when we try to emphasize the multidimensional uh, dimension of the, of the problems and also that the, uh, there must be a discussion uh, around various themes taking into account different approaches, north versus south, different regional approaches, the radical discussion, different theories, cultural elements and how they can be come together to, to help provide solutions uh, in the uh, direction of uh, sustainability. And of course, we a big part of our curriculum is to focus on the future, as I said. So it is one, I think, of the weaknesses that have been, as part of the reflection, been recognized as well as the nationally. So we need to have transformative thinking, not just thinking about solutions. These solutions must be debate and must be different, as I said, from what we've been doing, because if it's the same or in the same direction, we will not have done enough for the, uh, the planet. So uh, in the aspect, in terms of social and emotional learning dimension, we try to work to build core values and attitudes for sustainability. So we have a critical discussion of SDGs, and we try also to bring not only issues, but also challenges. So it's very important to challenge existing status quo to try to see what else can be done differently and how we can incorporate it into our knowledge and of course our skills and how our, uh, our students in the future can take it in their own domain, uh, professional domain and help build it further. So we want to emphasize one of key priorities these days is to emphasize cultivate empathy and compassion for other people and the planet so we have these diverse, these diverse teams, but we also try to build in the curriculum and multicultural, international, diverse uh, uh, discussion as well uh, in terms of uh, encouraging different views and encouraging sometimes challenges of those different views in a constructive way, though, in a way that does not offend uh, and does not, and it's based on respect. And of course, then to motivate uh, students to think in a way that will help them, as I said, in a transformational way. We just don't want students to learn what sustainable development is, what are the main challenges. This is something that's good at the basic level, but we want students to engage with solutions and those solutions to be more radical. And finally, on the behavioral level, we focus on trying to uh, take practical action. So we work, that's why we have these different sessions on practical solutions, sometimes to start with a practical problem, with a problem so instead of starting from the law in general, the theory behind the law, start with the problem. And then we expand outwards by identifying key issues of sustainability within that problem, identifying key legislation, and identifying how these two can be aligned to achieve the best possible outcome. So we do that in a way, and we try, of course, as you said, to expand the discussion beyond narrowly focused areas uh, to a more broader and interdisciplinary perspective. Uh, on that note, I will pass it to my uh, to Professor Ngobo to discuss the reflection, of what we've learned, and what we haven't, uh, where we have been, uh, we've succeeded in achieving, and what there is still uh, areas where uh, work is still uh, still needs to be done. Ngobo, uh, you are on mute. You are on mute, Ngobo. Please, uh, if you. Can. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much, Ilias. Yes. Yeah, so. Um, when we decided to do this, we knew that we're very much taking on a, a, a new approach to how uh, we, we embed or mainstream sustainability. And we had some initial uh, responses, uh, which we, some of which we expected, others which we didn't. Uh, we also knew we're taking a bit of a risk because why would I as a commercial lawyer want to go and do a program with a core module that says sustainable development in contemporary societies. Um, so we knew that from the onset, we had to continuously evaluate what we were doing here, what the students were saying, see what worked, see what didn't work. And over time, we kind of sort of come to a point where we kind of feel that we've embedded this properly and that it is of value to students. So what we find is that very early on, and, and, I, and, I, and I'm one of those who teach the first three modules, uh, students were initially resistant, um, sorry, first three sessions, initially resistant, they'll ask lots of questions about why is this important to my degree scheme, why do I have to do this, what is the relevance of this, uh, 
they were also very resistant to working in interdisciplinary groups. Uh, and I mean, it's a degree within law. So we, we created groups right at the beginning and we ensure that there is a good mix of students from different degree programs. And we try and explain to them it's so that they can look at the same problem through different eyes. So a human rights lawyer may have a completely different way of looking at a particular project from a commercial lawyer, from an environmental lawyer, or any other uh, person with uh, the different interest so there was that resistance but what we what we have found increasingly through the years and we've done this now for four years is that at the end of the module students did say that working in the interdisciplinary groups did engender learning for them that the questions that they were asking were clearly different and they were able to look at problems through the eyes of somebody else in another with another with a different focus from theirs. And so, for instance, sometimes what we find is that we, for instance, give a mining program, a, a case study or a, 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 an AI case study, how a human rights lawyer, law student, or somebody from that background looks at that issue is very different. And therefore, it allows for them to be able, when they move on uh, to the place of work, to be able to hear differently, see differently, and really seek for practical solutions um, as they go along. Uh, so for us now, what, what, what we're looking for going forward is that while students have developed better understanding of the complexities and the interlinkages, so they, they have a very good understanding now that sustainable development really isn't about the environment or environmental law per se, but that because we all live in the environment, whatever it is we're doing, whether you are going to be a project manager tomorrow, whether you're going to be a human rights lawyer, a commercial lawyer, a trade lawyer, there is no escaping an understanding of how we look at these principles and how we understand them. So those are some of the things that we're going to look at going forward, uh, how we better support students to understand this in interlinkages better. Uh, at what point do we introduce students to some of these concepts and ideas? And then in addition to in the theoretical aspects, the practical uh, 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 context that we, we, we expose them to, how can we expand that within the curriculum? Uh, of course, we are also very com uh, cognizant of the fact that we need to better mainstream the, bio the behavioral learning dimension to the extent that students are inspired, that they, they don't see this as a hurdle, just another module to pass, but as something that can critically affect their career path going forward, but also their contribution to society and societal goals as a, as a whole, so that we achieve the transformation that we hope that this module can help engender within the context of our LLM students' learning. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Ngobo, Elias Kapsis, and Claudia Albani. Uh, we enjoyed the presentation very much, and there will be lots of questions. But unfortunately, as you know, time now means we should move to the other group. Um, for the, May, to, for the um, next keynote address. So could I just invite anybody, if you've got professor, uh, any questions for Professor Mesa and her team, uh, to perhaps send them by direct chat. So that's, you know, the time pressure is off or, or email them. So thank you very much indeed for the presentation. <laughs>